Hey, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Dov Barron. How are you doing, Dov? Excellent. Thanks, John. Pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to serving you and the audience. Excellent. And Dov is up in lovely Vancouver today. I am. Excellent. And it is lovely. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know Dov, he's one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers. He's international leadership catalyst, um, leading authority on uh, authentic leadership. And he has a company um, that uh, and, a, and a philosophy that he calls Full Monty Leadership, which would be interesting to learn a little more about. And hopefully that he does, he stays clothed for the whole of that interview. I don't know. That's, uh... Can't guarantee it. <laughs> Cannot guarantee it. <laughs> and what we really wanted to talk about today was his book, Fiercely Loyal, about how to attract and, and keep uh, top talent. Um, so maybe starting at the beginning, Dov, what, you know, why is there a battle for and not just attracting but maintaining um, talent? Because you have some insights into... Um, I read into, you know, particularly millennials are only hang around like two years at the best, right, um, in a company. Mm -hmm. So so what what what, uh, what was the genesis of this book? Well, the genesis of the book was <clears throat> in my work working with uh, companies and, and leaders that they were complaining, you know, mm -hmm. how come millennials don't stick around? <laughs> I mean, first of all, let, let's let's categorize millennials so, yeah. so everybody understands because we say that term and it's thrown around, but I don't think people actually know so much. So many people think of millennials as being kids under 20. So just as you get it, millennials are 18 at the youngest and 38 at the oldest. Mm -hmm. So many millennials are already in leadership positions. Yeah. Now, when I entered the workforce, because I'm older than that considerably, uh, when I entered the workforce, there was a question. It was, what do you want to do? That was a 20 to 40 year question. Mm -hmm. That was what a career was. Now, just so everybody understands, a career for a millennial is four years, 10 times less, four years. And I did say a career, not a job. Right. Average millennial spends 1.2 to two years in a job that they like and that they enjoy. 47% of your workforce today is already looking for another job, even though they may not dislike where they work. Mm -hmm. So the, the bottom line is they have a lot more choices in the war on talent, talent won. They've got the power, they've got the choices, and you can bitch, you can moan, you can complain, you can say it shouldn't be like that, but that doesn't change reality. Mm -hmm. That's the reality of it. So it, it, there's two parts to this, right? So one is as organizations, um, we probably have to get, get used to higher levels of turnover, right? Um, some people really panic at that notion of turnover all the time. And on the other side of it, as you, uh, as you point out, we have to do a better job of creating an, a, an atmosphere where people feel fiercely loyal and want to stay for longer than the average is, right? Yeah, you've got to create the environment, um, and there's many ways to do that as outlined in the book. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the bottom line is this, that when you look at the list of what millennials want in order to be in a job, they want meaningful work. Money matters, but only to a, to a point. Once you get past about seventy to $72,000 a year, and that, by the way, that's prorated in lifestyle, so it's not actually the number. Right. Once you get past that, money doesn't matter that much. What matters much more is meaningful work. Well, what does that mean? It means I want to work for a company that has a higher agenda than profit, that there is a purpose with it. So we as leaders and organizations must be purpose-driven leaders in a, a driving a purpose-driven leadership, driving a purpose-driven company with purpose-driven culture. That is what sticks your people to you. But then you've got to create them to have their purpose and you've got to facilitate that. Yeah, so th there's a couple of interesting points to, to dissect there is you totally agree with, you know, purpose driven organization and meaningful. Um, but let's face it, like there's a lot of parts of our jobs and our work that even if you're in a purpose driven organization or whatever, it's not the most exciting. You know, there's still I mean, work still work. Right. So how do you how do you get over that? Because sometimes it feels like you have to spend a lot of your time trying to placate people for the fact that there's, there is drudgery in every job, right? 
Of course, there's a level of drudgery in every job, but there's a. But you see, again, this is the distinction mm -hmm. between purpose-driven work and non-purpose-driven work. So people look at me and they look at what I do. I travel the world. I speak all over the world. I work with very high-powered individuals and high-powered companies, you know. And they go, "Oh, it's very glamorous." Well, you know what? It's not very glamorous being patted down by by the security in the airport or sleeping in some bed that I don't want to be in, or you know, trying to work through three time zones in, in th four days. That's not fun, it's, that's the drudge of it. But the cream of it is the fact that I get to do my purpose every single day, and I have to take that purpose into the drudge. And this mm. is what most of us don't understand. So when I go into a company, I'll say, do you have your purpose? They'll say, yes. And some, actually what it really is, is bullshit on the wall that's actually mm. a mission statement that somebody made up. That's not a purpose. Purpose is always emotionally based because human beings, as much as we like to think we're logical, we have what's called emotional logic. It's what I'm writing my next book on. We have emotional logic. And when we apply that logic, that's what makes us move. That's what makes us decide what it is to do. So we can go through hell and high water if we feel there's a the outcome, the reason we're doing it is far bigger than just the profit or the fact that I've got to check the box. Mm -hmm. So how does it, so t talk me through, um, how does an organization ensure that they communicate that and continue to communicate it and reinforce it through their actions so it's it translates in a meaningful way to people at whatever job or level they are in the organization so that they can, like you, I mean, you understand that you have to go through some of these hassles in order to do the thing that you love to do. Um, how do you get it so that people in their everyday job understands that some of the hassles they got to go through is contributing to the greater purpose? It's a great question. So first of all, nobody's ever going to do that until they get to their purpose. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So we have to start there. So like I said, we start with the founders and the CEOs and the C-suite. We work with them. Then they go and, and do the work with their teams. But that purpose has to be evoked. It has to be elicited from those leaders. And it has, and then it has to be done inside the organization. We do it personally very hands-on with the executive board and the executive team. But then I have a program that I actually put the entire culture through right. so they get it. And what we do is we – and this is why, what helps you to get through it – is we help that person. So let's say this is the janitor, the mm -hmm. receptionist. It doesn't matter what level at. Once they know their purpose, that we help them to say, well, okay, how is this tied to the corporate purpose? If it's not, this is one of the things we say when we come yeah. into work, you are going to lose, like, you know, so we're fiercely loyal, how to, how to find and get, retain your top talent, right? Okay, but here's what you need to know. You're going to lose some of that talent because there's not an alignment of purpose. Mm -hmm. But it, purpose is this magnificent filter, this magnificent magnet, and as we all know, one side of a magnet attracts and the other side repels. Yeah. And that's what you want to do. You want to get those people out because more than three quarters of the workforce are disengaged. You want your work. I mean, just th think about that for a minute. Think about how well you're doing in your company today mm -hmm. with a workforce that might be three quarters disengaged. What would happen if you increase the engagement by 5%, 10%, 50%? My God, how incredibly successful you'd be. That's what purpose does. But you can only do that by having a purpose, uh, uh, engaging everybody in it, but having their purpose, this is what's important, tie in. So mm -hmm. I actually just wrote a new book called Purpose is Missing Peace. And right. you can actually find it. I made it into an ebook. It's Perfect. on Amazon. I made it super available for everybody. For And it's written for companies who want to do this. And it's how to bring the um, purpose of the individual into the organization so that they start acting like owners and really believe mm -hmm. in, not only in the purpose, but that this is a place that fulfills their purpose. And then they'll get up and they'll do whatever it is. And we know that millennials work more overtime than anybody else. We think they're lazy because they don't want to do nine to five, but they'll work at two in the morning, give them the room to do that. Mm. Yeah, so there's, a, a, again, there's a, there's a lot to unpack in what you said there, and there's some fascinating pieces. So, I mean, I think that's one message that you said, I mean, if you have uh, three quarters of your your workforce disengaged, yeah, uh, any any in, any percentage increase you can get in the engagement rate is going to have a massive impact on on productivity. And then, like I said, I, you said on the other side is, um, 
you know, then there's some people who you're never going to get engaged and maybe some people who aren't going to buy into the purpose or whatever. And you need to be able to disengage from those quickly. And, you know, Absolutely. like I said earlier, sometimes this is a this is I've often found this a real issue in in organizations, even ones that, you know, I've, I've run myself is that people panic all the time about turnover and they'll do everything desperate to hold on to people, even when those people aren't the right fit for the organization. Um, have you, Absolutely. I mean, you obviously come across that too, right? Yeah, I come across that all the time. And you see, and this is where, when people panic, they, they start looking at old solutions. Mm -hmm. So they go, well, we'll just give everybody a raise. That'll keep it. You know, we were brought into a company about a year and a half ago, and they were having a problem with retaining top talent, as you can imagine. Yeah. And so the founder was like, you know, these entitled shits, and you know, they, they, you know, they just want more money and they want more position. And I said, well, how do you pay them? And he said, we're paying over the industry standard. I go, great. And he goes, and they're still not sticking around. I go, well, what is it? And he goes, you know, well, we've done this and we've done that. And then they went through all the things. And then he said, you know, and for instance, we put bean bags in the in this in the staff room. We've added a cappuccino machine. We even put a foosball machine in there. Mm. And I said, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. I said, how many people use it? And they go, none. <laughs> this was a complete waste of time. And I yeah. said, right, why did you do it? He goes, well, Google do it, and they have. And I said, no, no. See, there's your point where you're missing out. In our generation, in the generation of baby boomers and even Gen Xers, mm -hmm. the boss told the staff, if you're going to lead millennials, you don't tell, you ask. So if you want, if you think, you know, maybe a foosball machine would be a good idea. Maybe nobody in your company gives a crap about foosball. Mm -hmm. You need to ask. Maybe nobody drinks coffee. So you don't need a cappuccino machine. You need to communicate. And so this is part of the thing around full Monty leadership is tearing down those walls, tearing down the, the facade, tearing down the title and beginning to communicate like human beings with each other and finding out what people really want. Then they become far more engaged because they feel like they're part of rather than being dictated to. And listen, you if you're a parent watching this, listening to this, You've got kids and you've given them great advice mm -hmm. and your kids have ignored it. Do you know why <laughs> they've ignored it? Be not because you, not, be not because your kids don't like you, yeah. but because we don't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, yeah. if you present them with choices, they'll very often make a great choice. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with your employees. You have to learn that as a leader, you need to be a great parent. Yeah. You know, yeah. So if you're sucking as a parent, I guarantee you're sucking <laughs> as a leader. And by the way, if you think you're a great parent, you might want to check with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, well, you know, there's that old rule of communication is that people trust conclusions they come to themselves uh, above anything you could ever tell them. And so part of your job is to help, you know, to help guide people and, you know, give them choice, guide people to the right conclusions. Um, but it's a so so for me, it's 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 fascinating because there is. Um, there is this there is this war on talent and there is as you said i think that example about the beanbags and the foosball table is a great one because i think people have latched onto these band-aids or they've said oh they do it then maybe we should do it and and uh, it's interesting you know how that how that uh, you know doesn't solve well, a problem said, it's a because it's a band-aid it doesn't solve a problem mm -hmm. um so um, so let's talk a little bit more about purpose, maybe get a little more granular, because as you said, you know, there's probably people listening who go, we're, we're a purpose driven company. In fact, I'll pull up our purpose right now and I'll read it to you. Right. So talk to yeah. me a little bit about how purpose becomes real as opposed to a bumper sticker. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So it, hopefully many of your viewers, listeners have uh, read Simon Sinek's Start With Why. It's a great book. Um, it's much better than what anything that's been out there before, but it's not purpose yet. Mm -hmm. So what we talk about in the work that we do, it's your why of your why. Now, again, I would encourage you to read Simon's book and I would encourage you to do that work. But the why of your why is to discover the emotional drivers that made you go into business, that made you pursue the role that you got to, whether you're a CFO or a CEO or whatever your role is. Think about what it is that drove you to that. Now, the initial answer to that in the hierarchy of needs is I wanted a better life for my family and for the people I love. Okay, but that's not your higher driver. So the unconscious higher driver was something else. 
And here's where, where people get stuck. They go, well, we're very, you know, I'll, somebody will say, here's our purpose. We're very passionate about healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I go, that's great. That's a passion. Passion and purpose are vastly different. And they go, well, no, it's the same. No, no, it's not. I promise you. Passion is transitory. The best example right. I've got is this. And, it, you know, it's a little gritty. So prepare yourself. <laughs> brace yourself. I'm going to ask John a personal question. John, are you a heterosexual male? I am. You are. Okay. So, and, and I'm not doing that to be personal, but just to give context to my question. As a heterosexual male, can you remember being somewhere between 15 and 19 years old? Uh, just in a vague sense. In a very vague way, yeah. yeah. Right. Can you remember what was on your mind all the time at that age? Um, yes, I can. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> and that hesitation, because yeah, yeah. it was the same thing that was on my mind. Yeah, f a football. <laughs> yeah. yeah well that's dirt in your eyes as he yeah. makes right so, yeah exactly so the truth of the matter is at that age you're mm. passionate right about something mm. and if if your passion was supposed to be your purpose then you would be living <laughs> it out and we'd all have jobs as gynecologists right exactly. we don't and that's good right? mm -hmm. that is yeah, a good yeah. thing so passion is transitory purpose is not purpose is evolving so here's the way to think of it your passion is the vehicle that transports your purpose. Mm. The vehicle may run out of fuel. The vehicle may break down, but the purpose does not. It simply gets out and walks and gets in a new vehicle. So if you are not going to feel this way about it in 10, 15, 20 years, it's probably not your purpose. Right. My purpose is exactly the same. I can remember the first time I had a glimpse of my purpose was at 10 years old. It's the same thing today. It just got deeper. It got more uh, elegant and more eloquent and more uh, applicable than it ever did. But it was always there. And and the fascinating um, thing about that is, you know, I just was writing down here um, that I don't think most of us know what our real purpose is. And I think that's part of where the issue comes from. I think, you know, if you went across, as you say, you know, C-suite of a lot of companies, whatever level, you would find if you put them on the spot and said, you know, what is your real purpose? There's very few of them could probably give you a good answer. And so, as you said, if you don't have a purpose or you don't know what your purpose is, then you're always going to have some level of dissatisfaction about where you are. You're going to have a level of dissatisfaction. You're also going to feel a little rudderless and you're going to be running your life on goals. Mm -hmm. The problem with goals, as we all know, you know, one of the things that I say about people who work with me privately is I say, you know, you, the people who work with me are already successful. So, so you've got success. Yeah. So if you get a new Rolex, you get a new Bentley, you get, is it going to make it better? And the answer is yes, it will for about five minutes or maybe a day or maybe a week mm -hmm. and then it won't. So we have to go from success to significance and on from significance to fulfillment and from there to creating a legacy. That's a vastly different thing. And you're absolutely right. When I speak to these high level individuals, it is extraordinarily rare that they've done the work to find their purpose. But every single one that I have met who has even before they met us mm -hmm. living these deeply fulfilled lives where they're very actively making creating a legacy that will outlive them and if i may i'll just tell you a yeah, very quick story do. an example of that when you probably know that in 1990 i fell off a mountain got smashed to pieces my life was destroyed and mm -hmm. i've had multiple reconstructive surgeries then the recovery was horrendous and extremely painful i can't go into the details because we don't have time for that sure. but what i will tell you is there came a point where I was in a very dark depression and I realized I had to find my purpose. And I went off and I began that journey and I did. I, I, I believed I found my purpose. But the problem with purpose is you don't know because it's your purpose. People aren't walking up going, oh, you're living yeah. your purpose. Yeah. They, they don't know. You have to. And so I was never quite sure. And I was always working on refining it and understanding it. Then one day after teaching a public seminar, back in those days we had a public seminar company, and at the end of this multiple day event, people were very gracious and they lined up to say thank you. And this lady was there and she looked to be in her early, early 40s, red hair, nice looking lady from Toronto. And she said, um, she said I want to say thank you for, for, for the program. And I said, that's great. Now, I, like most people, have a, a plexiglass shield. Compliments tend to bounce off it. Mm -hmm. So I want to let those compliments in. It's important. 
So my answer when somebody says that to me is, would you mind telling me specifically what you're thankful for? Right. And she was wonderful. She took a pause and she said, I want to thank you for my grandchildren. And I said, you don't look old enough to have grandchildren. And she said, I'm not. So over there, that's my daughter. I look over, there's a lady there. She goes, that's my daughter. As you can see, she's pregnant and that's her husband. And I said, yeah. She goes, what I've learned here about my purpose has completely changed my relationship with my daughter and my son-in-law and will change the will change my relationship with my grandchildren. And at that moment, I burst into tears because I realized I was living my life on purpose. When your life is on purpose, it's about a legacy that impacts the lives of people who will never know your name and whose name you may never know. That's the check. Yeah, and that, and I think that's that's such a powerful thing to say. And I just think that anybody watching this, there's so much... And people are so distracted today. People are so angry today. People are getting worked up about things that they have really no control over. Or, And I really think the message that you just delivered there, that if more people took a step back and said, you know, do I feel fulfilled? And if I don't, what, you know, where is the, where's the, what's the purpose of my life? And legacy. I love that idea of legacy. Um, I think the world would be a better place. I think a lot less people would be getting angry about external things if they were really figuring out what was driving them personally, right? You, you couldn't be more right. And, and, and this is particularly in the context of sales, because mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of sales organizations and people go, purpose and sales? I go, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, John, you know this better than, than probably I do, that we're not selling things People don't buy things, they buy into things, yeah. and this is important. So they buy into the salesperson, they buy into the to the benefits of the product, not the product itself. Nobody gives a crap about an iPhone, right? right? It, it's, we buy into what it can do for us. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you, when you own your purpose, people buy into that. That's how you create the loyalty. So you, the customer comes back. You know, I have a company I'm working with right now who have just pushed their prices up higher than they've ever been. They're in a commoditized market mm -hmm. where there are other companies delivering pretty much the same thing. And they are killing it. I mean, they are crushing it. And the reason is, is because purpose is at the front end of absolutely every single conversation. Not only sales conversation, every conversation. Purpose is right there. And so people are buying into the purpose and sales are going through the freaking roof. It purpose is at the granular level of selling. Mm -hmm. And when you get that, you don't, you don't, you suddenly all your sales techniques go out of the window. You don't need them because it's like, this is our purpose. Do you, are you with us or not? And they go, no, I'm not. Great. Moving right along. Next, yeah. are you with this purpose? Oh my God. Yeah. What are you selling? I'll buy a hundred. Anything. Yeah, no, I think, and that's that's a fantastic message to end on because I think that's uh, that's a really powerful message again, again for salespeople because we, you know, people, everybody gets sidetracked into other things, but. I agree with you. I think at the end of the day, like you said at the very beginning, there's an emotional logic. And I think you said you're writing your next book on that, which I, I look forward yeah, to. Indeed. Yeah, an emotional logic. And I think if you make those connections between product, service, purpose, then your emotional logic is going to kick in, right? You got it. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, Dov, this has been fantastic. Uh, before we go, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you? Thank you, John. I sincerely appreciate that. Uh, you can find out about me, uh, my products, and all of the, all the resources that we have are by going to fullmontyleadership.com, like the movie Full Monty. Fullmontyleadership.com. There you can find – there's a, a blog on there. It's under icons with over 500 articles. There's access to my podcast. It's the number one podcast in the world for Fortune 500 listeners. Uh, Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips. I'm on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those places. But you can Google Dov Baron, D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N. And here's the other thing I want to say to you is this. You know, John has taken the time to find great guests for you, so you to listen to and learn from. He takes his time to do this, and his guests give their time. We, if you want to understand sales, uh, uh, there's a thing called reciprocity. It's important that you show reciprocity, that this is a feedback loop. Write to John. Tell him what you got out of this episode. Tell him what you get out of the show and tell him what you're going to do with it. You can write to me, my email, very simple, dov at d-o-v-b-a-r-o-n, 
Dove at DoveBaron.com. Tell me what you got out of this show. Tell me what you're going to do with it. CC John in on it. And if I can help you in some way, if you want to work with me or want to bring me in to speak or your company, write to me. Just to, But I want to, I'm here to serve. That's why I'm on the planet. But I think it's important that you recognize this. Go to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to this show. Let John know the impact he's having. Uh, well, thanks, thanks, Dov. I, I appreciate that. It's um, and I agree with you. I mean, we we do this as a as a service to people. Um, but you know, I get a thousand percent more out of it, to be honest, um, by talking to people like yourself. Uh, it certainly made my presentations that I do my speaking a lot easier because I can pull on all these great guests that I've had in the past and quote people. So it's it's fantastic. Um, again, thanks, Dov. This has been fantastic. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon.